Okay, well, let me, uh, let me ask everybody to take their seats, please, and I think we'll go ahead and uh, get started. For those of you who are here, if you've got a beverage, you're all set. And we'll have a few more folks joining us as we, uh, as we battle these, uh, the uh, cold and icy conditions outside in our immediate environs. Okay, well... Again, let me wish you all a very good evening and a welcome to the Science History Institute and to the Joseph Priestley Society Lecture Series. For those of you in attendance here at the Institute, again, many thanks for joining us on a cold and icy evening in Philadelphia. I know it's tricky out there moving around. Um, and for the many more of you who are following the program online, thank you very much for being here virtually. I know that we are joined by attendees from around the globe, and I hope that it's much warmer wherever you are. Uh, your attendance at our programs is much appreciated, and I want to thank everyone for supporting this and the other institute programs with your philanthropy and your enthusiasm. We could not do this important work without you. Thank you very much. I would also like to offer a special welcome this evening to members of our co-founding organization, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, who organized a meeting of their fellows here at the Institute and are joining us for the lecture this evening. Now, where is Zenaida? Zenaida Gebhardt, if you could raise your hand, please. There she is. There's Zenaida. If, you, if you're present here in Philly and you would like to learn more about the AICHE, I encourage you to introduce yourself to Zenaida and her colleagues during the reception that will follow the presentation. I'd also like to remind you of another upcoming Institute event when the weather warms up a bit. On Friday, March 22nd, Friday, March 22nd from 6 to 8 p.m., we will host a lecture for both in-person and virtual audiences. That lecture is entitled Science in the Medieval Islamic World. Science in the Medieval Islamic World. That'll be presented by Dr. Shireen Hamza of Harvard University. This lecture is part of our new Science and Society series that explores science's historical impact on society via lectures and in-depth conversations with leading scientists, historians, policymakers, and educators. So please mark your calendars for March 22nd and do join us for that lecture and reception. But this evening, this evening, you are in for a special treat. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Keenan Sahin as our first Priestly Society lecturer for 2024. Dr. Sahin has had an extraordinary career spanning six decades as an academic, a technologist, an innovator, and an entrepreneur. He received his BS and his PhD degrees from MIT in the 1960s and subsequently served on the faculties of MIT, Harvard, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. In 1982, Dr. Sahin embarked on a career as an entrepreneur, founding Keenan Systems with a $1,000 personal investment. It grew. The company became a world leader in telecommunications software, creating nearly 1,000 professional jobs, and Dr. Sahin was named the Ernst & Young New England Entrepreneur of the Year in 1998. In 1999, he sold Keenan Systems to Lucent Technologies Bell Labs, and he became vice president of software technology at Bell Labs, subsequently president of Lucent Software Products Group, managing 4,500 people until he returned to Boston and founded his current firm, Tyax, in 2002. His adventures at Tyax over the last 20 years, including his resurrection of much of the fabled Arthur D. Little Company, are the subject of his lecture this evening. Over the last two decades, Dr. Sahin's accomplishments have merited many honors and recognitions. I mentioned just a couple. In 2003, the World Economic Forum named him one of the, its 40 technology pioneers. And in 2010, he was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Dr. Sahin has served on many nonprofit boards, including the MIT board as a life member emeritus, and the boards of Argonne National Laboratories and the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Over a career in academe, industry, and the nonprofit world, 
He has accumulated many experiences and stories worth sharing, and we look forward to hearing those now. There will be time for questions at the end of his presentation, and I want to encourage those online to share their questions via the Q&A function, and we'll, of course, we'll be, we'll be circulating and taking your questions here in the room as well. And now, will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Keenan Sine. I, I don't think I uh, uh, recognize the person that was just described. <laughs> but one part is true. I have many stories, and I love to tell stories. And tonight, what I will discover is probably one of the longest stories of my life. So in some sense, it's a story of an entrepreneurship. In some sense, it's a personal story. So with that, let me plunge in. And since Dave covered the person that I don't recognize, he covered many aspects. So I can, when I go through it, I will skip those details. Those details are important uh, to give you a context of why I did what I did in retrospect. Should I have done it? Should I have not done it? I still have not been able to resolve that. Um, so restoration and an industrial legend, Arthur D. Little Company. That's a mouthful for a presentation. That's 150 years, and I'm not that old. And I am old, but not that old. So I have to compress all of these things. Uh, so I did something here that, OK, there we go. The beginnings. Uh, let me start with this very famed company, Arthur D. Little. And you'll see a biography posted and on the company. But the part about the company is not quite accurate. So I will try to correct that uh, matter tonight. And maybe, uh, Dave, you will post the correction, and maybe not. Now, here is Arthur D. Little's laboratory notebook, which I have the great pleasure of uh, owning, having. And uh, that's the label on his notebook, uh, 1932. And there is himself, in his own words, who he is, attached to this notebook. He had many other notebooks, but this one had this attached. And I took one part, because that's relevant to chemistry and chemical engineering. President, American Chemical Society, 1912 to 14. Uh, American Institute of uh, Chemical Engineers, 1919. Society of Chemical Industry, 1928-29, and so on. Now, the part about School of Chemical Engineering is a little bit, I think, um, uh, needs explanation, because there is no School of Chemical Engineering practice at MIT. There is a Department of Chemical Engineering, and uh, Mr. Little played a very important role in that, and I will explain that. And he also uh, was a Perkin medalist and received multiple doctorates. That's why sometimes he's called Mr. Little, Sometimes he's called Dr. Little. Now, his accomplishments are even more remarkable because he did not finish high school and yet got into MIT. Clearly, MIT recognized something in him because it's not very usual now. It's impossible now. At that time, it was unusual. And he did not complete his degree in chemistry either because his family could not afford his senior year. But I did examine his transcripts. MIT still has the transcripts. And I think he probably concluded that he would be better off in industry and pursue a career in industry. And he did. And he made a huge, huge impact. And if he had pursued uh, an academic path, I don't know if things would have come out as well. Now, after leaving MIT, he went to Richmond Paper Company age 22, and met a senior person, Griffin, Roger Griffin. And the two of them decided to start a company. Audacious, but they did, Griffin and Little. So what does Mr. Little do? Write to his, my dear father. 
I am starting a company. Great. For the first six months, we don't expect to have any business. And I'm reading this as a father and saying, what does this mean? Appeal to the ultimate angel funders. And he posted, it was 12 pages, it goes on and on and on. Posted from Canton, Massachusetts. So here's the letter. By the way, that yellow underlining, I did that in the image. The original is nicely preserved. Nicely preserved. No, no, and, and I was very careful. And there's the envelope. Someone clipped the stamp, some stamp collector. But the envelope is intact. That's the letter. He says, Griffin and I are to open a laboratory in Boston. Great news, Dad. We shall probably have little to do the first six months, but are reasonably sure of a fair amount of work. Every entrepreneur says that. Yeah, it's the beginning will be tough, but we'll make it. My comment appealed to mom and dad. And I don't know if his dad came through. I really don't know. But in 1983, disaster struck. Mr. Griffin died in a lab accident. I guess the lab standards were not as high, or maybe he was careless, there was an explosion. But Mr. Little teamed up with uh, Mr. Dr. Walker, who was a chemistry instructor at MIT. And two of them very rapidly proceeded to form Little and Walker. Now, Little and Walker had seven employees in 1895. And I will mention this because this uh, root, the foundation notion of the company, actually played a role both in its growth and eventually in its demise. And I inherited the Tayaks, a culture that I could trace back all the way to this. Seven employees and seven departments. Analytical, coal and derivatives, lubrication, biology, textiles, engineering, forest products. Now that also sounds like an academia. Academia, MIT all told has 1,000 professors for all the fields in the world, including humanities, economics, you name it. How does that happen? Well, each academic is like a small business person. They've got their domain. So these seven original employees had their domain. Fast forward to later years of uh, Arthur D. Little, it didn't change. People viewed themselves as catering to customers to their projects. And uh, that was important for the growth, and at the same time, later on, it might have been an issue. Now, in 1901, he married Henrietta Rogers Anthony, uh, but they had no children, so he adopted the, his nephew, whose father had died, as their son, Royal Little. Now, Royal Little doesn't get much billing. Very few people know about Royal Little. Actually, he was, in some sense, just as much, perhaps more impactful than Arthur D. Little, the uncle. He was, in so many ways, the founder of conglomerates in the United States. He was invited to join the company. He did not want to join the company, but he did later on push Arthur Little D, uh, forward, and I will mention that in just a short while. In 1909, a man who became very famous as Justice Brandeis incorporated Arthur D. Little uh, because uh, uh, Dr. Walker decided to return to MIT. So Mr. Little was in charge, and it became Arthur D. Little. And Brandeis, at that time an attorney, charged $47 to do the incorporation. So that was, the company was launched in 1909. So that is 14 plus 9, 23 years later after its founding. Now the first transition, I will come back to some of the earlier years. Uh, he died in 1935, and in his will left it to MIT, upon the death of his widow. And his share was 55% of the company upon his death. And there's a New York Times uh, piece that says MIT to share uh, stock in research concern. And at his death, ADL was 50, 
And I will say only 50 because ADS impact was far greater than 50 people, far greater. And one of the questions is, how do you achieve that? And so I give the company a great deal of credit. And in my own uh, ventures, both in academia and so on, I've tried to hone the art of doing more with less. It's an art. It's an art. And he clearly had that art, a master of that art. Second transition and transformation. During the war years, MIT had a big impact on ADL. In many ways, influenced it, it influenced its work. In 1951-52, Royal Little said, time has come to pull ADL from MIT's yoke. And of course, MIT wasn't just gifted. <laughs> it was a gift to MIT. <laughs> so you have to buy the gifts back. <laughs> yeah. So they had to value the company. And the valuation of the uh, company, uh, I will come to that a little bit later, uh, it was also an important figure. And for tax reasons, Royal Little, being now a seasoned businessman, wanted to minimize the taxes. And one way he thought was creating an ESOP. So you basically pay the employees with stock, and that defers the taxes, and so on and so forth. And that's something that's widely spread now. Stock options are, in some sense, a variation of that. The classical ADL became technology and innovation unit, eventually, embedded in the consulting, management consulting. And I can tell the story why Arthur D. Little went into management consulting. Part of it is MIT. Part of it is the uh, armed forces, defense department, operations research. Operations research was an important project during the war years, and it spawned a lot of work in so-called management science operations research, um, the algorithms, uh, traveling salesman algorithm, optimization algorithms, and if you think about it, that's strategy. What's your objective? What is it that you want to do? Minimize cost, maximize revenue, min maximize your profits, uh, 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 shortest time, and a lot of algorithms were being developed for the armed forces. Later on, these migrated into the field and became actually the discipline of operations research. Engineering schools call it operations research. Business schools call it management science. Same thing. And many of those algorithms, by the way, affect us today. Amazon operates with those algorithms. Traveling salesmen, assignment, and so on and so forth. That's why ADL partly went into strategy, strategy consulting, which became management consulting. And by the time uh, you know, 2000 came around, ADL was operating out of 46 offices in 30 countries with 3,000 employees. But TNI, the classical ADL, remained around 150, grew to about 300. And that's where my life, in some sense, began, which I will explain in a short while. So unquestionably, it's a great company. It was a great company. And its impact is still continuing. Unquestionably, uh, it was far greater than its size. It was a launch pad for many companies, including Boston Consulting Group. There's a little bit of a juicy story there. Bruce Henderson, who started Boston Consulting Group, was he fired from ADL and hired by US Trust? Or was he uh, on assignment to US Trust and US Trust set up a consulting group for net worth, high net worth individuals in Boston? I won't tell you which story is true. You can do the research. <laughs> but however it was done, Bruce Henderson went to US Trust and from there it was Boston Consulting Group one of the biggest consulting companies in the world, also in Boston. And from Boston Consulting Group came Bain. So one can say there's a linkage there. And Arthur Little had a knack for publicity. And I looked at his first ad in 1886, beautifully written ad, beautifully. And he believed in advertising. In many journals, he advertised. And he also wanted to kind of popularize. You can call it sensationalize. You can call it popularize. One of them was people say, you can't make 
silk out of sow's ears. I was a chemist. Of course you can. So they had a bucket full of sow's ears that they got. And they knew acetate, they knew of chemistry, and they made two uh, purses. One purse is at the Smithsonian, and we have the other purse. And I made sure it was properly preserved because it was really coming apart. Now, at MIT, this man's genius was already obvious. Uh, even though he didn't finish, he founded two publications. He had a knack for writing. Uh, the uh, Tech, which is still the main newspaper, and MIT Technology Review, now a major magazine. He chaired MIT's visiting committee for Department of Chemistry. I serve on the board, as David said, as a life member. I've served on many visiting committees. That's MIT's magic, visiting committees. It's unique. Every department goes through a visiting committee review every two years, and it's brutal. And the chairman of the visiting committee comes to the board and says, these are the issues. This is how they are messing things up. These are the, some of the things we have to do. And also, there are very nice proposals. And I actually looked at the visiting committee report that Mr. Little chaired, and it recommended that MIT have a chemical engineering department. So he was tasked with going to Mr. Eastman to raise the money. <laughs> and he did. $300,000. By the way, Eastman eventually wrote a check, multiple checks, of about $20 million. He was responsible for the MIT campus, which moved from Boston to Cambridge. But it was secret until his death, until his death. But at that time, uh, uh, Mr. Little was able to extract $300,000. and MIT established chemical engineering. And then, of course, he left the company to MIT. But financially, and I have a wide range of background uh, in, in technology. I understand business. I started the business. I ran a Lucent's business and so on and so forth. So I looked at the finances of the company. The company was not a stellar success until the 60s. And even then, success would come crashing down. I'm not trying to take anything away, but one has to understand the technology side, the impact, and the business side. And on the business side, here are some numbers. In 1909, when it was incorporated by attorney Brandeis, it had only 22 employees. And $2,000 in cash in the bank, $7,000 in receivables, and fixed assets of 11,000. This is according to Khan, I reference it at the end. Well, that is not a sign of a financially very successful company after 23 years of operation. And it took 25 years to reach profitability. After they got incorporated, two more years, they finally found land. Not six months, as he was hoping it would be the case. And the numbers for the last five years of Mr. Little's stewardship are even more dismal. This is according to Khan, average $6,230. So the company was always at the edge and yet managed to make a big impact. That in itself is a remarkable accomplishment. I don't want to diminish that. There are many companies, there are thousands of companies. In our country, we have five million applications for companies Every year, five million. 200 make it to IPO every year. So in between, many companies are struggling and they don't make any impact. They just quietly vanish. Here's a company on the edge. We still talk about Arthur D. Little. So I want to mention that. So I'm mentioning these numbers not to indicate that it was a failure. On the contrary, they managed to go on for 116 years. Now, in 1953, when uh, ADL became independent, of course, MIT, uh, I know it, I saw it on the board, no university gives things away free. They're used to receiving, not giving, right? So uh, it had to be valued, MIT's share, and the value, I'm sure they hired uh, aggressive uh, valuation experts, was only $1.3 million. So by 1953 standards, that's not much. That's not much. So 
Now I will talk about bankruptcy and liquidation. Uh, and that's the part that's not mentioned in the history. And I can understand because ADL as a name still exists as a consulting company, but it's owned by a French company called Altran. And it doesn't even operate in the United States. Uh, now, this is how ADL was described in 2001. Pioneered contract research, true, consulting business. We are one of the world's leading consulting firms, true. Revenue, $600 million, 3,000 employees worldwide. And this is the map of ADL, it's true, in 2001. Fast forward one year, 12 months. This is what happened. New York Times, February 6, 2002. Arthur D. Little, the oldest consulting firm in the country, announced yesterday that it would file for bankruptcy protection as a precursor to its acquisition by Cerberus Capital Management of New York for $17 million. How do you go from $600 million in revenue, 3,000 employees across the world to forced bankruptcy for $71 million? Now, when other creditors and some European employees objected, this is stealing the company. And by the way, servers means three-headed dog that guards the hell, gates of hell. Who would name a company servers? And this was that company that was going to walk away with ADL for $71 million. So they said no. So the judge in Worcester said there has to be an auction. That's the ultimate market test, right? OK, let's submit it to the market. Let's see what happens. So the auction did take place on April 4. And I know it all too well. And I'll tell you why I know it all too well. It took place on April 4. 2002 in Boston at the offices of Goodwin Proctor, the lawyers of ADL. And this is what happened. Tyex received, uh, purchased the assets of, in bankruptcy, you don't purchase people because it's not a business purchase. You buy the assets and then you make offers to the people at your discretion. You could hire one or you could buy everyone hire everyone. So TIEX acquired the assets of technology and innovation, including 50 laboratories, and hired all 300 employees. And the rest went to Navigant, Management Consulting Utilities, Altran had non-US offices, Charles River picked up chem 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 chemistry and engineering consulting, public sector management, in Washington, D.C., went to ICF, and so on. And here are the numbers. Altran of France uh, purchased the assets of and hired the people of a consulting. It was a very complex transaction. Management uh, buyouts, remember, it's 43 countries. And in each country, they had to come to terms, and so on. They also purchased the Arthur D. Little name. Tyex tried it, but Altran had all kinds of complex schemes. And at the end, it just seemed best to just let it go. And TIEX paid $17 million. It was the least performing part of the business. And it was losing, it turned out, money hand over fist. So now I want to tell you the story of restoration. That's the personal story. But I had to give you this background, because without this background, it didn't make sense. Why would this company with 3,000 people, $600 million in revenue, suddenly just be liquidated, not even reorganized? Now you understand why and how. So Mercer apparently wanted to buy the consulting business. They had no interest in the technology and innovation part. 
And so uh, in a book uh, that is uh, uh, mentioned, A. Watts, uh, he wrote a rise and fall. Uh, he says, in retrospect, if management would have sold the consulting part and invested in uh, TNI, maybe things would have been better. That's actually what happened as a result of the auction. But the money did not come from selling the consulting part, which never would have happened because the consultants dominated the company. They were on the board, they were all over. How would they have agreed to being sold? No way. Absolutely no way. So TIEX, the name uh, Technology and Innovation Applications, accelerated LLC. And that investment from TIEX, and you're looking at the person, was a sizable one. I'll mention it later on. Uh, why TIEX? Why me? Why my interest? I mean, how do I relate to this thing? I don't. I was a bystander watching R&D in our country implode. And I will give you a little bit of my background, which they've summarized. I've been at MIT since 1961. And like little, I've been a life member of the board on many visiting committees. And I would often walk by the ADL building on East Campus when ADL was basically TNI. They did animal research, life, life research, chemistry, you name it. But it was research and development contract. And for me, for a person who was keenly interested in innovation and implementation, that fascinated me. How do you go from innovation to implementation? I invented, I patents and so on, but that's not where I got my excitement. I got my excitement seeing things implemented. That's where the impact is. You can invent, write 100 papers, maybe three people read your papers, you're just gone. Where's the impact? The impact is in the implementation. It's very difficult. So my beacons were ADL, Cambridge. A lot of my classmates were trying to get into ADL, not succeeding. ADL had become so arrogant that when you sent your resume, they wouldn't even send you an acknowledgment that they had received your resume because they were getting so many resumes. And Lucent, um, Bell Labs was the same thing. I mean, I mean getting into Bell Labs it was almost impossible. You had to go through 10 different interviews because they would allow you into the shrine of, uh, and these were aspirations in my mind. So what happened? In 1982, I was still an academic teaching, Sloan Fellows, these are mid-level executives who come to MIT to get their degrees. Bill Ford is an example, Kofi Annan, these were in quotes, my students. They taught me more than I taught them. But I still was an instructor, and their question was still the same, all these accomplished executives. Keenan, will this be on the exam? <laughs> and um, so I got cold feet. As my age advanced, I was an instructor at age 25. I could say anything. I mean, I knew it all, and, and so on. By the time I hit my mid-30s, I started getting a little bit worried that I was pontificating. How did I know? You're an academic creates or fabricates. Both are correct. You don't know whether you created something or you've created all kinds of, fabricated all kinds of falsehoods. You have to validate them. If you're a chemist, you can go to your laboratory. But if you're talking about organizational engineering, companies, how do you validate them? You have to go to the field. And I was in artificial intelligence, expert systems, operations research, management science, all of these things, IT. So I said, let me start a company, and let's see if I can run some safe experiments. So that's why I didn't accept anybody's money. It was not meant to be profitable. It was not meant to be a true business, but it became one. So. Later on, when it became a real business, I had to form a board. I'm a great believer in checks and balances, in everything. And checks and balances were born right here, next door. And I, I wanted to practice that in companies. And here I was, 
by 1986, in just four, four short years, I had 25 absolutely stellar employees. Sole shareholder, unchecked CEO. I said, I can't live with that. So I went to Howard Johnson, who was president of MIT previously, chairman of the board of MIT. I said, Howard, would you please be the chairman of my board? And if you tell me to go to hell, I probably will try to find a way. I respect you that much. But he said, Kenan, I won't do it. And if I'm going to do it, I have to bring Jerry Wiesner with me. I said, Jerry Wiesner, it was another MIT president. He was Johnson Science Advisor and, uh, and Kennedy Science Advisor. He was, the man was a legend. I, I said, Howard, I don't know. I can't even call you by your first names. But Jerry Wiesner joined and stayed on the board for eight years. The company grew. They changed the name, by the way, to Kenan Systems. It was not my proposal. And in 1999, Lucent approached me. And I said, we're not interested, except for one condition. I want all my technical colleagues, 750 of them, be members of Bell Labs. And uh, they said, come on, Kieran. I mean, and Howard Johnson said, are you sure, Kieran, you want to ask that? I said, that's the only reason. The company was 50% profitable. Cash margins were 50%. And 17 years we operated the company, only one quarter we lost money. And uh, it was, so there was no reason. There was no reason, except to have my colleagues, and I was at that time 60 years old, I worried if something happened to me, what will happen to the company? And I had two little sons, three. So anyway, Lucent accepted that, and I became VP of Bell Labs and group president at Lucent. And now I saw Bell Labs for what it is. On the one hand, Bell Labs is a legend, and rightly so. But Bell Labs, I found out, is nestled inside the mothership. Huge, AT&T. Lucent, when it became part of Lucent, 137,000 people. Bell Labs, 5,000. 800 people, the true Bell Labs people, the Nobel laureates, free to roam the corridors. 4,000, the translation engineers trying to sell Bell Labs innovations to the rest of Lucent. ADL, technology innovation, nestled inside the 3,000 companies. I said, it's the same thing. If the mothership sinks, this part will also sink. And that's what happened. And I could see the parallels very quickly. So here I was, returned to Boston, quiet life, and pondering about dot, dot com bust. Why did it happen? Why is R&D collapsing in our nation? Why are our big companies abandoning R&D labs? What happened to the white coats that used to be at DuPont, at GM, you name it? Thousands of PhDs, they disappeared, vanished. Polaroid gone, Kodak gone, digital gone, ADL on, on the brink, Lucent uh, trying to go down. And as a former academic, I said, I have to get into this topic. I wrote a short article. If you're interested, I gave the um, uh, reference. I said, the innovation, there's a huge innovation backlog here. What should we do about it? It's like a farmer raising wonderful crops. There's no way of taking it to the market. They just rot in the field. What a shame. What a waste. So I wrote a letter to the president of ADL, Ms. McNamara. I said, I have an eclectic background. Could we get together, have a cup of coffee, maybe I have dinner, and I can share with you some of my insights and ideas. Your situation is very similar to uh, Bell Labs and uh, Lucent. A uh, big mothership and a small entity inside. Maybe it'll be helpful to you. Well, she didn't answer. And I was planning a book on this R&D in our country, the innovation supply chain, all of these things. And she didn't respond. When she didn't respond, I moved on. And I'm announcing today, even fam my family doesn't know, the book is coming out. I did write the book on Kenan Systems. And I'm now trying to write the book on 
Tyx, that's next. And uh, here's the jacket, lean startup to lean company and rich exit. And uh, how to apply Keenan Systems uh, principles to today's startups. And I was a little bit worried, so I really wanted to have some prominent people in the field read the abstract, read the first chapter, to see if they could generate some endorsements. Because you don't know. I mean, I, I, I you know, said, OK, it ended well. But I'm very pleased, and one of them I will mention because he was a prominent chemical engineer. And, and here are two endorsements the book got. One is Dr. Robert Langer, what successful scientific entrepreneurship is all about, of great value to any entrepreneur. And the other one is from the Dean of Sloan School of Management, an unusual and unusually compelling contribution to the literature on innovation, leadership, and strategy, a heartfelt human story of courage, invention, growth, learning, and reflection, and extraordinary impact. When I got those kinds of endorsements, then I said, okay, I will push forward with the book. Now, it's a story, all kinds of stories, all kinds of names. It may or may not receive enough attention, but I wanted to highlight Dr. Langer, chemical engineer, and got his doctorate from MIT. And he's a very modest man. Um, he came to give a presentation recently. You will know that he is the most cited engineer in the world and second cited scientist in the world. He founded over 40 companies. He was elected to all three academies and has received honorary degrees from 41 universities. And he's still pushing on and he still had the time to write that endorsement, never mind the content. And he said he would do it. I sent him the abstract and all of that. Two days later, he sent it in. I guess that's why he can do all of these things. <laughs> so, by the way, the platform that we developed at Keenan Systems, I want to highlight that too, Impact. Uh, after I left, Lucent named it Keenan Billing Platform. I learned. A few years ago, I was so busy with Tyx, I learned a few years ago that platform processes now one-third of the global telecommunications subscribers, one billion. It's, not, it's uh, in the hands of another company called MDocs, and they wrote to me. They gave me this information. So I feel the Keenan Systems experiment ended successfully. Not monetarily. That was not the real purpose. The real purpose was impact. So billion subscribers and 1,400 people are working on that system. It's probably the largest AI platform in uh, you know, use today because it was based on expert systems, natural language process. That's a different story. So what happened? How did I get involved? I thought my letter was forgotten, but it was not. Julian Loki, which was tasked with liquidation, had found my letter. I don't know how they got my letter. I mean, it was written to the president. And she was gone after the bankruptcy. So they called me on my Blackberry. Uh, at 6 PM, I maybe shouldn't have taken the call. I mean, it changed my life. Um, I said, OK, who's, who would be calling me at 6 PM at night? And the guy said, look, we saw your letter. There's going to be an auction. ADL will be split into five lots. I said, what are you talking about? I thought ADL had gone into reorganization. Nope, he said the judge refused it. Now I know why. Because Cerberus was going to steal the company. So the judge said, no, no, no. We have to take it to the market. Rightly so. That's why it was divided into five auctions, I mean five lots, to see if they could get a lot of value. So sort of sell the assets separately. And... Uh, so I said, you know, I went to New York, met with them, and I said, I'm just solo here. I'm not interested. I, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, but I'm interested in TNI. I want to find out more. And they said, well, you have to sort of show interest because the data is highly confidential. We're in the middle of a sale. 
And we can't just tell you, and you'll go and report to Boston Globe, for heaven's sake. Boston Globe is after us anyway. So it's highly confidential. I had to sign NDAs. I couldn't really talk about it, uh, but I had to submit a bid, and I submitted the bid and uh, formed a, uh, a single-member company, TIEX, to submit the bid. And I told the lawyer, our chances are zero. We went to the campus once. I met with these amazing people, really impressed by them, their credentials. Laboratories were unbelievable, 50 laboratories all over, honeycomb of laboratories. Walked away. I said, it's great. So I will download all kinds of data, write the books, and have a nice, quiet, peaceful life and get on with whatever came along. Well, that was not to be. So we enabled the auction. Why? Because that $17 million tipped it over $71 million. That's why the auction took place. If Tyax hadn't shown up, servers would have walked away. They probably would have liquidated TNI right away because you know, it was very expensive business and so on and so forth. So I showed up on April 4th to interview 30 plus companies. I mean, everyone who's who was supposedly going to come. They did their due diligence, I found out. Some spent million dollars to do due diligence, to go through all the records and so on. They didn't come. <laughs> so at seven o'clock, here I am with the lawyer, the auctioneer comes in, and I'm still in my enthusiastic mode. You know, I'm going to interview, I'm going to, I've collected already a lot of data, I write nice books, I examine what's happening, and so on and so forth. Auctioneer comes and says, I'm starting with TNI, Technology Innovation. We have one bidder, TIEX, going once, going twice. I couldn't say stop, I want to take my bid back. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Too late. There were all kinds of penalty clauses, you know, many millions of dollars. And that wasn't a concern, could have done it. But I said, wow, I walked into it. Let's see what happens. And here's what happened. Answered the letter. Answered, I mean, wrote a letter, answered calls of ours, curiosity. So I had to show up on Monday because the you know, auction was finished on Thursday. We were told the judge would approve the bids on Friday. On Monday, work would start. Wow. That weekend was an amazing weekend. You know, what did you do? <laughs> well, 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 how are you going to get out of this? So Monday morning, bright and early, like an eager student, I showed on the campus of Arthur D. Little, alewife, 450,000 square feet. About 1,500 of ADL employees on that campus. I went to the door reception, I knew where it was, I'd gone there once, and the receptionist, an elderly woman, hands shaking, said, sir, this is a secure facility, I don't know who you are, I never heard of TIEX, you can't come in. <laughs> I said, ma'am, I said, I'm coming in as the president of TIEX, still, I was puzzled. The word had not gotten back to the campus, because it happened on Thursday, this is Monday morning. Monday morning, jeez. So I, I uh, called Dr. Collins, and I tell you that. And I'm telling you the story. Clearly, we succeeded. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. So let me tell you how things evolved from April 8 to today and still evolving. It's a good ending. Much like Keenan Systems had a good ending. The middle was tough. I died many deaths at Keenan Systems. I died more deaths at this because I was starting with a hole in the ground. And I didn't know there was a hole in the ground. For me, ADL was next to the clouds. So it's my visitor's pass. My colleague, John Collins, came. <laughs> he signed me in as ADLer because there was no tax yet. I mean, the infrastructure had not been established. Nothing, no stationary, nothing. Just a name. Just a name. 
By the way, John Collins was exceptionally good. He was an MIT PhD, mechanical engineer, and so on. So I sat down with John. I'm unprepared. I'm unplanned. But I'm not inexperienced. I knew business, <laughs> especially the business part of business. You don't run a company for 17 years, every quarter profitable except one quarter. You have to pay attention to all kinds of details. So I said, John, do we have a lease here? He said, no, Ken, we don't have a lease, really. <laughs> ADL, the estate has the lease. Estate is bankrupt, it's creditors. I said, do we have health care? Because employees I know care a lot about medical insurance. He said, well, ADL was self-insured. I said, self-insured. So we don't have a medical plan that we can quickly take over. Nope. And I said, how much business do we have? We have 300 employees. I had the option of not hiring anybody. But that would not have worked. Might as well just walked away, paid a few million dollars, and said, I'm the wrong person. So I said, how much business do we have, John? And kind of sheepishly, he said, Keenan, maybe 150 people. Wow, we have 300 people. And a good chunk of the contracts were government contracts. They have to be innovated. You can't buy government contracts. US government does not sell contracts. And customers didn't know. In fact, they, they, for many months, they asked me, who the hell is Tyax? Even the government came to me and said, who's Tyax? We don't have any records for you guys. I said, that's because we're new, sir. That's all. That's all. <laughs> and there were many other unpleasant surprises. So classical ADL now as Tyax. So I went that night, April 8, all alone. Couldn't share it with anybody. What I saw was disaster, absolute disaster. And I was solely alone in charge of the disaster. So what do I do? Well, I had to act fast. And I said, I have to quickly address the intangibles. When you run a business, you quickly understand the intangibles are more important than the tangibles. If you lose the confidence, the trust of your staff, you're doomed. And here's 300 people. And then I had to address the tangibles, each one monumental, money, lease, benefits, accounting, rates. We didn't have any government approved rates. We didn't have a government approved accounting system. There was no IT, no sales organization, no accounting, because it was part, it was a department. So that night I said, this is not investment. I will view this as a gift from the angels to continue my experiment. I had the money. You have to spend the money somehow. So I will push on. Restoration. Let me see if one can apply some of the principles of academia, some of the principles I learned at Kinnan Systems and Practice, to restoring. So that meant turn around, not turn around, no layoffs, no salary cuts, and come across as a robust company, and we're moving forward. And I had to come up with a vocabulary, because one thing I learned at Kinnan Systems was you have to have a good vocabulary for a company. Lexicon is very important. It's words that convey ideas. If you don't have the right words, you can't convey your ideas. People won't understand. And it has to be short. You can't have 15 sentences to describe what you're trying to do. By the time you get to the fifth word, people have already lost interest. What the hell are you talking about? So TNI to TIEX transformation to lexicon. So I met with the staff on April 10. I remember the day. I had a big smile on my face. Inside was just, just deteriorating. I'm scared out of my mind. But you can't, you can't say that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I'm sorry that I did this. I'm just one person. And so on and so forth. I announced right away, day three. We'll get benefits ASAP. We did. By the end of that week, we had our insurance plan in place. I said, no layoffs. 
no salary cuts, a new business model, and I'm not coming in as an investor. I'm coming alone. I don't have a management team. It's all unplanned, and I will work alongside you, and we'll see what happens. Now, their take, I was looking at these eyes, 300 pairs of puzzled eyes, <laughs> highly trained people. I mean, these people had done hundreds of projects. Looking at me, and my take was, I can work with them. These are really bright, capable, well-trained people. I can pick up where I left at Bell Labs. I knew how to blend innovation with implementation. I developed a lot of ideas on that. So I can bring all these experiences. I have the resolve to push on. So I will figure out one day at a time. That's what you do. That's what you do. As Eisenhower said, planning is essential. Plans are useless. You keep making plans, and you keep discarding your plans. And I also go by another dictum. Face the facts brutally, but never lose courage. So I was facing the facts brutally. <laughs> I mean, these facts were really brutal. Their take, is this real? <laughs> this unknown guy is like a solo cowboy coming into Dodge City with two rusty pistols, not even riding a horse, riding a mule. <laughs> and he's saying everything will be all right. Really, really. I mean, I could see, I could read their thoughts. And he says, this is not an investment. Who would spend millions of dollars and say, I don't expect a return? Really, this is a business. To this day, they say it. They still, there are a few people who say, Kim, it's been many years. What, what do you want to really get out of this? I said, I've gotten all I want. We've succeeded. That's all. We've made impact. So I did one thing very quickly. I understand the importance of influence and authority, credibility by association. I was not credible. I would not have believed myself if I was sitting in that room. This guy is, is fake. <laughs> yeah, are, is he kidding, kidding us? Doesn't even have a management team. What is this? What's he going to do? Is this a hobby? So I went to Chuck West, president of MIT. I said, Chuck, you have to come in as the chairman of my advisory board. He said, Kenan, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I, I'm not MIT to run. I'm on three boards. I said, Chuck, please. Please. I mean, Paul Gray, a former MIT president, was on the board of ADL when it went bankrupt. So Chuck reluctantly accepted, but he said, I'm not coming into a sinking ship, Kenan. You have to show me your plans, and I have to examine them. I have to be convinced that you have a solid plan to go forward. I said, I do, Chuck. I do. So we went through all that, and I said, it's restoration, Chuck. And I know this is going to cost. Eventually, what went in from moi topped 100 million. And I have no regrets about it. No regrets about it. Money has to be spent somehow. So long as I myself don't go bankrupt, <laughs> that I wouldn't want to. So suddenly, when Chuck, I announced, was our chairman of the advisory board, my credibility went sky high. I mean, after all, he was the president of the most, one of the most successful R&D organizations in the world, and he's saying Kenan is real. I endorse him. So that was big. There he is, Chuck West, cutting the ribbon, Tyax. I miss him. Yeah, as you know, he, he was an excellent president for MIT. He was the dean of university presidents, and he left MIT. And when he was leaving MIT, uh, he informed me, because he was on the board. He said, Kenan, I'm leaving. I said, Chuck, please don't do it. Please don't do it. He said, Kenan, I've done this for 14 years. And every baseball player thinks there's one more season in him. And I know I don't have one more season. <laughs> and uh, he said, there are five deans to be reappointed. I don't want to be the guy. 
So he went and became president of National Academy of Engineering, as you know, and he died of pancreatic cancer. Now, this was what I explained to Chuck. I said, Chuck, I wrote an article about it. There's a big innovation gap in our country. Universities are cranking out all these innovations, and the number of product introductions is stagnant. And there are reasons, I said, here are the reasons. Academic incentives, having been an academic for nearly 20 years, define limits. You have to get your tenure, you have to get your grants. You can't get involved in activities that will distract you. I said small scale ent uh, entrepreneurship lacks market penetration. Funding for commercialization companies formed by academics is limited. How much money can you raise? You know, some, to make something really successful of this magnitude, you do need 100, 200 million dollars. And surround technologies are not available. Academics are isolated. They're in a research environment. They have one technology, one pony, but you need a cart, you need wheels, you need all kinds of things. But I said industry can't stop with lab models. They can't quantify development risks. They can't easily go back to source of modifications and they don't have access to strong technologies. So I said, I'm proposing that we position TIEX as the interface company. Universities do a lot of research, some development. Industry does some research this, this century, some development, a lot of delivery. They're excellent in delivery. So I said, why should we be in product business? Why duplicate the industry? So I said, I want TNI, now TIEX, to use our laboratories, do some research, do a lot of development, do a lot of delivery. So we created, uh, very quickly, created legal, accounting, HR, IT, procurement. By the end of the summer, Tyax was a full-fledged company. It was not easy. That's why I said I died many deaths. And how did I do it? Not by hiring a lot of people. You don't want to hire people on top of 300 people when you have a payroll of 300, but enough to support 150. So I repurpose people constantly. And when you're dealing with bright people, it's amazing the things that they can do. You can take a PhD in mechanical engineering, turn him into an accountant, very competent accountant. He'll get it if you teach. And I had established that Keenan Systems a teach and learn culture. And I brought it to TIEX. I said, we have to teach each other, learn from each other. Now, here is where an important strategy came into play. There's an old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Just when I said repurpose, but that's different. It's culture, I'm talking about culture. My father used to say, son, habits will not leave. They're right next to the soul. Until the soul leaves, the habits won't leave. So I said, how do I deal with consultants? They viewed themselves as consultants, used to giving IP. They had uh, accepted the big lie. I call it the big lie. I pay for it, therefore it's mine. All lawyers say that to you. You do contract R&D, we own the IP. And I, I, at Keenan Systems, I say, that's a big lie, sir. You buy a car, you don't own the IP. Who owns the IP of General Motors? and so on. Still, I, I, I would win the battles, but it's constant battle. So I said, I am going to make TIEX the customer so that it would be change, but no change. Since I had uh, 150 people, I said, look, I want to interview each one of you, understand your knowledge base, turn it into, gave it a lexicon, kernel. And I'm going to establish a technology circle, 10 of you. Pretend that you're making a, a proposal to NSF. Pretend you're making a proposal to DuPont. In this case, the client happens to be TIEX. And we will choose some of them, finance them, and all the IP belongs to the client. You don't have to worry about that. It just so happens the client is TIEX. That's what I call change, but no change. And it worked. It worked. They had no objection to that. Because on their timesheets, they could write project 25-A, 
project 25-A was a Tyax project. And 26B was a DuPont project. Same thing. So that's kernels. And I applied many of the principles at Keenan Systems. You'll find them in that book if you one day wish to get it. It will come out on, on I think, March 27. Me to we. Consultants tend to be me. My client, my work, my revenue, my profits, and so on. How do you convert that to we? Situational leadership, teach and learn, do more with less, dynamically configurable organizations, flat communication with interruptibility, and uh, the owner also works for the company. People have this false notion that the owner of the company owns the company. And I used to argue with my colleagues, please don't call me owner. Are you cattle? You're people. I don't own you. You don't own me. We both work for the company. Now, my financial package is different. In this case, I don't get anything. My salary is zero. <laughs> you actually get a salary. But we all work for the company. So you can criticize me. If I don't do my job, don't worry. Just and so on. So anyway, these things helped. Converged many areas. T and I had gone into every, every area that the consultants wanted. There were seven sectors, 35 units. Down selected those and spun out in 2014, Chemex Power. Um, now, I will take just a quick few. I know I'm now coming to the end. This is the model that I, it happens to be, in this case, Chemex Power, but it is actually TIEX too. Innovation sources, I said we're agnostic. We might invent it, someone else might invent it. It's early stage. We take it on our own dime, process it, and we create products for manufacturing partners that are de-risk, hyper-protected, and scale-up ready. I've educated a lot of executives. I've dealt with a lot of executives. They speak with four tongues. They say, we want innovation. When you present innovation, who says, who are your customers? What's your price? How many did you produce? I said, sir, this is innovation. Didn't you say innovation? Well, I guess you misunderstood me. I mean, I can't just adopt that. Who's going to adopt it in my company? You have to have near product, de-risked, IP protected, and scale up rating. So that's the flow. And for the manufacturing partners, partners is accelerated organic growth, shortened time to market and profitability, lower risk, and so on. So I used to go to, to clients and say, you don't have to buy a company, because many CEOs like to buy companies for the product. I said, you can actually have the equivalent of buying a company. You license the product. And you hire us for a while, and then fire us. And we'll be delighted that you fired us. Because we can now go on to the next thing. So you don't have to buy us. It's a new model in many ways. And it worked. So we also implemented new laboratory concepts. It's what I call 360 degrees. Because if you want to sell a tire to an automobile company, you better understand the car. You better build a car with your tire. So we invested heavily in new laboratories, pilot plants, and do the scale up and so on and so forth. It's very costly. It's not cheap. And we reached, I thought we would reach profitability. It took us a little bit longer, 15 years. We're now really profitable. Attrition did bring equilibrium. That was my idea, that in due time. So in appearance, we've achieved restoration. We do look like uh, TNI, but substance is very different. The HVAC system is different. We have HVAC. Uh, in the, you know, an old building doesn't have an HVAC. Uh, it, 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 it operates very differently. But the appearance is still an R&D firm that is generating developing products. And since 2021, we've been exceptionally profitable. We have 100 key patents, 400 disclosures, 150 SPI wins. We have 10 products. And each of these products are making a big impact. And I will mention a few. We started with an SPIR in 2003 to solve a problem that the Air Force had not been able to solve since the Vietnam years. Our pilots were flying with obsolete flight suits in these modern jets. Now, it may say, what's the big deal about flight suit? There were 126 performance requirements. And here are some of them. It's not just a suit. 
the pilot is flying at 50,000 feet, and if he needs to eject, he pushes a button, suddenly he's at 600 miles an hour with a flight suit. You want to make sure his arm doesn't fly away. You want to make sure he survives, and then he falls into the water. You want to make sure he doesn't freeze. His collar has to close, or he flies into a battle zone. In Camp Bio, you want to make 126 performance requirements. No one had been able to crack this nut. We did it. And right now, I'm happy to report that all F-22 pilots are flying with this flight suit, and they're happy. We're getting very good reports. And these have become six products. Now, DLA is buying them. They all have SKUs products. And we have two manufacturing partners. And uh, DLA is buying it for F-15s, F-16s, F-22s, and so on and so forth. I have to tell you, negotiating with the government, I've been doing it since 80s, is not easy. Our government is the most astute buyer in the world. Don't believe the stories about waste. And our government is the most successful VC in the world. Almost all important technologies have come out of government funding since the Second War. Just make a list of all the important technologies. Computers, GPS, you name it. So anyway, it's not easy doing business, but we cracked that nut. By the way, one of the most difficult things was sizing. Because you have to know, the pilots, some pilots are giant, some pilots are short, there are women, we have to accommodate women, and so on. At 50,000 feet, by the way, you can't step out of your airplane to go to a toilet. So you have to take that into account. And you also, at 50,000 feet, if the pilot makes a big turn at 4G, 5G, the pilot passes away. And you have to change the pressure so that the blood stays in the, in the brain. And on and on. that's why 126 performance requirements. So here's another one. We developed an underwater compass system as a product. We sell it to Lockheed Martin. We sell it to, uh, uh, it's now Ellis as, uh, Harris. And it is the most reliable underwater compass for its size. And it's used across the Navy. And it took millions of dollars of investment to achieve the calibration needed. It works across the globe. It's that complicated. It's obviously a magnetic compass. We developed, this is my pride and joy. Uh, I was talking earlier in 2003, my conviction was lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. Electric vehicles would solve substantial part of environmental impact of CO2 since 30, 40% of emissions come from the transportation sector. And my reasoning was it will have to be high energy cathode uh, material, not iron phosphate. Uh, and so invested heavily in high nickel chemistries, 2003. And, um, and the cathode is extremely important. Uh, it's not only uh, 50, 60% of the cost, but almost half of it is metals nickel, cobalt, and so on. So we developed uh, our first round. We got some patents in 2004. They were OK, but they did not really capture the markets because it was a single product. At Keenan Systems, I had learned the power of a platform. So in 2009, working with a new team, there were people that I had hired, uh, Dr. Ofer and others. We made a big breakthrough invention, and we went into what I call particle engineering into the crystallites, into the grain boundaries. And we made many discoveries, and we got our patents just one year before the Koreans. And we got the patents in China, in Korea, Japan, which gave us hell, Europe, and the United States. And this invention reduces cobalt, provides higher power, higher energy, extreme temperatures. By the way, iron phosphate is losing its capacity because of lower temperatures, not this material. We go to minus 50, minus 50. People didn't understand this, its importance. And uh, when you have a novel material, people don't believe you. That's why we invested heavily in complete 360 degree. So I could actually scale these things up talk to the Japanese, talk to the Koreans, and say it's all scaled up. It's ready to go. So 
uh, it reduces cobalt down to 5% in high nickel. And the impact on, on national security is enormous. When you go from 20% cobalt and you're looking at million tons of cathode material, you go from 20% to 5%, suddenly cobalt is not a big issue. And with aluminum, we've been able to reduce it to 3%. And we also invented high manganese, uh, which reduces the cost, which competes with LFP. I won't get into all the world politics and dynamics because China is promoting LFP and so on. This is a game changer. And we also have a wonderful platform business model for developing uh, products, services. And that's our algorithm, which we're developing. But you need the laboratories, coherent laboratories, not each uh, like an academic turning on his own dime. You have to have cohesion. When you have a product at the end, you have to have a cohesion. And we have that. And uh, we won an award in Japan uh, way back. And here's the big accomplishment. It took me personally from 2002 to 2012, that's 18 years, 18 years. I started with the top managers at Samsung. They had already pra were practicing. Anyway, I won't skip. I will skip that part. It was not easy. It was not easy. At the end, they came to the table, licensed it. I said, I want a press release. They said, we don't do that. We haven't done it for 20 years. I said, then I'm walking away. I don't have a board. I don't have investors. I don't have shareholders. You're talking to the guy, and you're practicing it. I want a press release. Press release was issued. The, rest, the second one was a little bit easier, LG Energy Solutions, again from the top. LG Energy Solutions accounts for 25% of sales. CATL is the other pr producer, Chinese. We've excluded China. General Motors depends on LG Energy Solutions. There are a lot of joint ventures. They licensed it. Uh, LNF of Korea, premier cathode maker. They just closed, just recently, $2 billion deal with Tesla, supplying cathode material. They licensed it, yelling and screaming. The hardest was Umicor. Umicor is the biggest supplier of cathode materials. It's a 200, 300-year-old company that goes to Congo, Belgian company. They started with mining cobalt. And for three years, they tried to destroy our patents. And I don't blame them. That's how big companies work. Some of my former colleagues, in fact, were recruited by them to do that. They licensed it, more is in the pipeline. And I'm working with my colleagues for an ultra safe cell. It's uh, zero volt storable. Our defense department is extremely interested because lithium ion batteries require maintenance. You can't leave them at zero volt. We invented a version that has good performance, that has good form, that you can store for years. And when you want to turn it on, you can charge it in less than 10 minutes, goes to 10,000 cycles, and has high power discharge and so on and so forth. And we've gotten patents on that. It's IP protected. Uh, we're building a new facility to scale it up. I think that's going to have a wonderful impact, and we're uh, scaling it up. We invented and patented and developed a short detection, battery short detection. NASA is using it. Navy is using it to take these 18650s. It takes about six months sometimes to find a cancer, a small short. Our invention is so powerful, you drop it. Two hours later, you know whether, whether there's a small cancer in it or not and we're trying to field it, what's next? Well, this is our new facility. I'm very proud of it in Middleton. We're building, a, uh, the building is built. Uh, we're populating it with new laboratories, modern laboratories. Uh, it's going to require a lot of investment. This is our pilot plant nearby, and uh, that will allow us to resume our core model de-risked, IP-protected, scalable products. And we can bring any chemical industry into the cathode business. Cathode business is growing to 20 to $25 billion globally. 
because we have it all. And we don't make. So there's no competition. So a big chemical company can come to us. That's the ultimate consulting. In one year, we can put them in business. And I'm working on that. And uh, with 360 degree facility, we can accelerate choice of chemistries. There are 250 electric vehicle models being introduced. And we're one unique company that can quickly test this chemistry, that chemistry, and so on. So my conclusion, it took a little bit longer, restoration strategy framework for a heritage company can work, and it's worth it. I'm writing a book to describe such a framework. Royal Little, I found out, they've written a nice book, How to Lose 100 Million and Other Valuable Advice. And I'm writing a book, How to Lose, this is the subtitle, How to Lose 100, 100 Million and Not Regret It, and Other Valuable Recommendations. <laughs> so many thanks. John, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is John Piasecki, and uh, uh, we have an R&D company that I run with my brother. And uh, one of the challenges that we've had over the years that we've been doing research and development is that when you go to the large company, typically manufacturing-based company, they have an R&D department. And when you come in with the innovative idea, uh, you get a not invented here syndrome and in essence, a uh, re negative reaction from the the in organic R and D organization. How have you run into that, and how have you dealt with? Oh, and how? With and how? And how? R and D is the wrong place to go to. It's not just uh, not invented here syndrome, but uh, my own teams have the same reaction to things coming from the outside. They have a budget, so when you go. That means management is going to dilute their budget to support what you present. So you're basically asking them to lose their jobs. And that's a tall order. But it comes across differently. They're not going to say that. That's one reason. The other reason is management has to see the value. And R&D is one of the last organizations to show the value. Why? Because management is suspicious of R&D anyway. Uh, the R&D rhetoric is we need more money, more time, and the management says, when the hell are you going to finish it so we can take it to the marketplace? Well, it needs a little bit more work. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to fire all of you. We're going to buy this company here because they've already done the work. So that's one reason why R&D, especially when the Japanese threatened us, disappeared. So you have to start with the executive. The executive has to see the vision has to see the value. And then you can come into R&D. R&D uh, may not be able to adopt it, but they can veto it. They can kill it. So you have to find a way around it, and, uh, and so on. I can maybe offline go through many, many steps. Uh, but it's a very complex process. Very compl and it's very common, what you're encountering. curious as to what your concept of restoration is. That's right. Uh, turnaround would have been letting 150 people go on day one. So when you buy a building, classical building, you want turnaround, you tear the building down, there's a valuable lot underneath, and you build a new building. It's cheaper, faster, but you've lost the heritage. So that's why I call it restoration. We kept 300 people, they kept their jobs, they left on their own volition, and we extracted the knowledge packets, repurposed them, much like this building was an old building. You restored it, you repurposed it, rather than tearing it down, that would have been turned around. It's very difficult, very expensive. Yep. 
Uh, great talk, and thank you for uh, sharing your story. Uh, you talked of many guiding principles in your presentation, but in your opinion, what is the most key one that a member of an organization can strive to implement and enhance innovation in their company from the bottom up? Dave, I didn't quite, maybe you can summarize. Could you repeat the question? Yep. What is one guiding principle that a member of an organization can use to enhance innovation in their company from the bottom up? Well, I will highlight uh, three. One is not enough. Uh, one is right from the beginning, dispense with this notion that I own the company because it misleads people. They think they are much more powerful than they really are and should be. The second principle is teach and learn, learn and teach. Don't be embarrassed by being ignorant. It's far worse remaining ignorant. And so that's uh, teach and learn, learn and teach. The other one is situational leadership. And that's a very important concept. You have to know your limits. And beyond a point, pass the leadership to someone else. And I myself practice it all the time. I find someone who's much better than I am in certain phase of the project. I might start the project, but I say, you take it over. Now, there are two ways of taking it over. One is still remaining the boss. You control everything. The other is genuinely saying, you're in charge. I really am on your team. You tell me what I should do. Situation leaders. Those three, I would highlight. There are many more. Uh, in the book, uh, and there's another book that's forthcoming, I try to identify many, many principles. I'm sure there'll be other questions that perhaps can be answered offline or there are drinks available for those of you who are here. For those of you who are joining us online, many thanks for uh, being part of our presentation tonight. It's uh, one more round of, of a thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's really an honor. I thank you. I really thank you for giving me the privilege of telling the story. Please join us for a beverage and a nash. I'll also join my dear wife here. <laughs>